we can adjust HP. So simple, right? Consider introducing hazards into the combat. The legendary action starter pack. I have to caution everyone. A fun game is our ultimate goal. Eyes on the prize, people. At phase two. In my previous video, I discussed why fudging a combat encounter is a powerful tool for DMs when used correctly. And from then, I also found out this neat paragraph from the Waterdeep Dragon Heist book, Modifying Encounter. If you need to increase the difficulty of an encounter that has already begun, have enemy reinforcements arrive during the battle. If you find an encounter too deadly, reduce the antagonist's hit points, have NPC arrive to help the characters, or have the bad guys cut their losses and flee. Look at that! The game designer also advocates for DM smoking mirror! On to seamless fudging! 5 methods, use them all, use them interchangeably, use them together. I'm gonna dive real deep into method number 3, but number 5 is the real kicker. Let's go! The first method, playing the enemy more optimally or less optimally depending on situation. Less optimal example. The tux nods and turns her gaze toward Barbarian, succumbs to the creative taunting from Barbarian player. Or the enemy gets cocky, or the pain is getting to them, enraging them, causing them to make mistake. Or they don't know of player character's healing abilities and doesn't double tap a downed party member. Or perhaps they don't use their best legendary option, or don't use their best spell. More optimal example, the enemy's eyes narrow and on the prize. After round 1, they rally among themselves and realize which target they should focus fire first. Or they counterspell a critical spell, perhaps a healing word on a downed party member. They are desperate to win, and worse, they are smart about it. This first method does not require any tinkering with the monster's stat block or game mechanic but require good description from the DM to really bring the monster behavior to life and have them make sense. Smoke and mirror. The second method, battlefield changes. Have enemies back up arrives. Seeing that the tide of battle has turned against them, the orc warrior covers his chest wound with one hand to slow the bleeding. His other hand hastily grabs the horn from his belt and blows into it. The sound echoes through the canyon. For a brief moment after that, it's dead silence. But then, you hear faint rushing footsteps from the east, along with orcish war crises. Or have enemies running away, losing morale. Seeing that the tide of battle has turned against them, the smugness from the orcs' faces are wiped away one by one. Their smile have turned upside down. They start to look among themselves, nervously. The one with the biggest mouth just a few moments ago now instinctively puts one fit behind himself, then another. Stay in formation! The orcish chief quickly barks, but seems to be fallen onto deaf ears. Those are two sides of the same coin. When DMs need some combat fudging. Powered by, you know it, DM Smoke and Mirror. We could also add harsh environmental effects. The autumn wind picks up its pace. From just a breeze, it's now becoming strong wind, coming in waves, hoisting up dirt and debris on the road with them. All ranged weapon attack has disadvantage in the strong wind. Or, Sorcerer, as you end your turn, you notice your feet swiftly sinks into the sand. You have entered a quicksand area. There is a laundry list of hazards that we can choose from to best fit where the party is taking combat in. Consider introducing hazards into the combat if the combat is not hard enough, or take the hazard away if the combat is harder than expected. Example of hazard from Dungeon Master's Guide are Extreme Cold, Extreme Heat, Strong wind, heavy precipitation, frigid water. We can also take the blizzard from Icewind Dale, or minor environmental effect from Dragon Heist. The third method, adjusting monster stat block. Mid fight, that is. Now we're getting into the good stuff. 
we can adjust HP. It's so simple and so effective. Since an average D&D combat lasts about 3 rounds, a good rule of thumb is that if the party is not critting or missing like crazy during round 1, they should reduce about one third of the monster HP on average. If the party is doing particularly well or use good tactic, they may be able to reduce more HP. Or if the party misses excessively, they may reduce less. If the monster HP by the end of round 1 seems way off the mark, that means we miscalculated things during preparation. Adjust it. So simple, right? Now, if we plan for a combat to last a different amount of rounds, say X rounds, then just make sure the monster HP is reduced by around 1 over X its max HP by the end of round 1. But I would advise against continuously fine tuning the monster HP in subsequent rounds because humans are terrible, terrible at mimicking randomness, especially when we have to manage a thousand things going on in a DD battle map with smoke blowing out of our ears. Not the kind of smoke and mirror we desire. Players who catch on to how monsters always dramatically die around the same time despite all the random factors in combat. We can further mess with the stat block by adding legendary stuff. If it already has legendary action, consider giving it more legendary action or more uses of legendary action per round. These can be easy to either prepare or even improvise in the middle of play. The legendary action starter pack usually have Move, moving up to its speed or half speed Attack, make one attack Detect, make a perception check Depending on monster, they may also have Hide, grapple, show, cast a country. I don't recommend suddenly giving the monster a much stronger legendary action because it wouldn't make sense why the monster doesn't use that strong option earlier we can also add legendary resistance or a better and more fun alternative, legendary recovery. Now what is that? Legendary recovery is my homebrew mechanics that still serves the purpose of keeping monster alive longer but doesn't entirely invalidate player spells and abilities. It's kinda like a non-shitty version of legendary resistance. Here's the mechanics and I'm gonna quote myself. Legendary Recovery At the end of the monster's turn, it can choose to end all effects, conditions, and spells of its choice that are currently affecting it. It can use its ability X times per day. I recommend 3 times, but choose the number that fits your needs. This way, a strong spell could still take effect shortly before it's shrugged off. The monster is still not immediately shut down, but the player can feel the impact on the fight. Pretty cool, right? Now, if you find this video helpful so far, go ahead and give it a like. Subscribe for more DMing tips like this. And why are you down there? Let me know how many of these methods that you've already been using. Or just leave your favorite emoji in the comment. It helps with the algorithm a lot, making this video reach more dungeon masters. Thank you. Alright, let's get back on track. What if I tell you that we can change the monster's stat block mid-fight, but spin it in a way that players love? Add Phase 2 This concept has been invented since the very old days of video games. From Rockman to Elden Ring, boss monsters often have different phases doing slightly or sometimes entirely different things. And that is celebrated as good game design, keeping the player on edge, making combat exciting. But uh, Tian, we're talking about improvising things on the fly here. How can we just pull a whole phase 2 out of our ass if we did not prepare? I will talk more about actually designing a cool phase 2 in a different video, but for improvising, we can closely approximate a phase 2 by giving the monster an ability that triggers at half HP. By the time the main monster is reduced to half HP, we likely have a good sense whether this fight is as hard as we intended or not. If it's not, this is the good time to act. The half HP triggered ability can be something happening instantaneously, or a small buff that applies to the monster for the rest of the fight. Many folks like to call falling below half HP being bloody, that's probably a remnant from a previous edition. So, I call these bloody abilities. After Paladin strikes the beast, you can all see its eyes turn red, moving around widely. It sucks in air through its clenched jaw, currently dripping with blood, and lets loose a furious primal roar. Everyone within 60 feet of this creature roll me a wisdom save DC 14 or be frightened of it. That's one example. Others could be 
the monster can immediately use Insert Ability at the end of the turn that it is reduced to half HP. I recommend letting the monster use its Recharge Ability here. A spellcaster may be able to immediately cast a predetermined spell, likely their strongest spell at this point. If we want to go with the route of a lasting buff until the monster dies, then there are several options, giving it one additional attack in the multi-attack feature, or increasing its speed, or fortifying its mental saving throws, or giving it the effect of the Shield of Faith spell without concentration, as its guard is intervening. You get the idea. Minor detail, but important. We need to make the bloody ability triggering only once per fight, or once per rest, or once per long rest, so we don't get into the weird situation where the monster regains HP and reduced to below half again. It's not fitting for such a climactic ability to trigger many times due to silly game mechanics. I often find myself designing the bloody ability, but depending on the fight, if the monster is already stronger than I expected, then I may not reveal the bloody ability at all. If a player asks to look at the monster's stat block after the fight, then burn the piece of paper in front of them, T-pose them to a of dominance, they shall never know. <sighs> and what's gonna happen after phase 2, I wonder? Why yes, of course, it's the beloved phase 3! <laughs> Just kidding, I do not recommend it adding a phase 3 unless it's the final, final boss, the BBEG, because that's a bit too much for just about every other D&D fight. It's gonna take too long. But we can still create some semblance of a threat even after phase 2 by giving the monster a death throws. Some damage will do, or if you feel particularly creative, inflict some condition. That's basically a dying screw you too from the monster. This is more effective if the party still has more encounter during the day. Speaking of which, Method number 4, Chain Subsequent Encounters. This is the most seamless method, and the easiest to pull off. Just plan ahead the intended difficulty for a chain of encounter, or the difficulty of an adventuring day. Then, we could adjust the incoming encounters based on how the party did in the previous one. Effective pass without choice. And lastly, when all else fails, when the combat, for one reason or another, is miles away from what we've planned, then there's always this one last effective method. Method number 5. Coming clean. Tell the players that we messed up. A mistake was made in combat design, and DMs don't always have to shoulder the responsibility by themselves. DMs have mountains of work to do, players understand. And at the point where things got out of control, it is important that a decision is made as a group. Each group has a different preference on what constitutes a fun and satisfying story. Come up with a solution together. I have to caution everyone. From my experience, players are much more likely to go along with the decision to buff a monster rather than go along with the decision to nerf a monster. Players don't usually want to back down from a hard fight, which is fine and all, but a TPK, a total party kill, can also usually put a damper on a campaign. Some people handle character death better or worse than others. I leave this part to your group discretion. Nonetheless, coming clean about a combat design mistake is a step in the right direction. It opens things up for a solution. The DM has to use all the tools available in the toolbox to facilitate a fun game for everyone. Yes, a fun game is our ultimate goal. Eyes on the prize, people. We don't abuse smoke and mirror just for kicks and giggles. We use that tool carefully to tell a compelling story for our table. And sometimes, to maintain that goal, we have to pull back the curtain a little and be honest. Now some may say that coming clean is also just another trick, that DMs are all sick in the head power tripping bastard. <sighs> no comment from me. Take of that what you will. Now that we know all of these smoke and mirrors method, make sure to sprinkle them into combat design once in a while, even when we don't really need to fudge combat. This will vary players' expectation and not immediately give away that we're fudging combat when we really need to. 
Plus, sprinkling them around should be an easy task because all the methods provided here are good monster design methods anyway. They make for more dynamic and exciting combat. This is equivalent to randomly rolling a die and go, hmm, when there's nothing happening to keep players on their toes, not knowing when we're actually rolling for monster stealth. Wait, 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 what is this? DMs? Smoke and mirror? My next video will be talking about these similar methods in a different light, using them to actually create an interesting and dynamic combat encounter instead of just improvising them mid-fight. Until then, check out my previous video talking about a big mistake I made that ruined players' fun in combat. And above all, have fun, but never at the expense of others.